Angela for that song. If you would, turn your Bible to Galatians, Galatians chapter number 5, Galatians chapter number 5. You know, I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about um, the um, folks that when trials and troubles come, um, instead of getting closer to the Lord, they they often um, get further away from the Lord. And, you know, there's, there's a uh, fear. As a pastor, you watch families go through uh, a trial. Brother Randy, I'm going to turn this one on here. You watch them go through a trial and go through a tribulation, and instead of getting closer to God, they, they drift further away from the Lord. I've seen it time and time again. I've seen it even in our church. You watch a family that at one time was on fire for the Lord or seemed like they were growing in the Lord and coming to the altar often and uh, making promises and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this and I'm going to serve and I'm going to be faithful and uh, join the church and uh, they uh, go through their first trial because obviously um, you go through trials when you become a follower of Jesus and often people cannot, they can't comprehend why, uh, why, why God would put them through a trial and they're they're a Christian. Why they why they would have a trial? And often uh, they they apparently are not either in their Bible. But nowhere in the Bible have I found that if you follow Jesus, everything's just going to be all easy, and and there's not going to be trials. Matter of fact, our trials should bring us closer to the Lord. Paul said that I may know Him, and uh, the only way you're going to know Christ is you're going to know Him in that valley, um, and you're going to get to know Him real sweet. Often, you know what people want to do. Uh, instead of running to the house of God for comfort and for fellowship and for Bible, they, they get bitter and they say, I don't want none of that. Isn't that the, the, just the exact opposite of what you should do? And they do that time and time again. I've watched family make poor decisions. Uh, and, and when they're going through the fire, instead of getting close to God, they get further away. And uh, that's the exact opposite. Let me challenge you before we get into tonight's message for just a few minutes. Um, listen, when you find that trials have come in your life and you find that things is getting pretty tight and pretty, uh, pretty, uh, uh, you know, uh, just intense in your life and, and there's different things going on, don't, don't become distant. Uh, man, won't you reach out to somebody and say, hey, I don't know how much more I can handle, but will you please pray for me? Amen. I heard a song today and I about wrecked my truck and that would have been a very bad day. Um, I backed into my mailbox yesterday morning and scratched my truck, and that's the way I started out the morning, and that was a trial, and uh, it was, and uh, it was not good because when the Chevy has a scratch on the back, and it ain't a deer horn or a or a or or a briars you're going through, but a mailbox, it it really it makes your day kind of start out pretty bad. And uh, mailbox is fine. Mailbox didn't even hurt the mailbox. Scratch it. I wish it would have tore the mailbox out of the ground. Didn't even hurt the mailbox. Which I put the mailbox in the ground. That's probably why it just stood there. Buddy, we concreted in the ground. Amen. And uh, But uh, it did scratch up the, the, the side of my truck a little bit. So um, anyway... Um, I don't even know why I told you that. But, you know, you start out your day bad. I just wanted to confess that, that it did affect my spirit. And, uh, but, you know, often, uh, often we do uh, have things that do come up. And uh, they're just, they're just going to be things in your life that's just going to cre creep in. And uh, sickness, uh, ser and that's, of course, what I told you is not a, I, I'm, I'm being humorous. But at the same time, there really is legitimate things that we could get uh, if all of us stood up in here tonight and started testifying about trials and troubles and things that we're facing and going through we'd all uh, before it end over we'd, we'd probably uh, leave here crying and uh, depressed and uh, all that stuff and I can't I don't understand why some of you go through what you go through and um, I just I don't expect uh, I don't I don't expect you to understand what I go through but I know this I know one who holds tomorrow and no matter what you're facing tonight, no matter if it's a marital problem, if it, and you know what, you can try to fix those problems on your own, but why don't you just give them to God? You can't, listen, you can't fix a marriage. 
And that's a complicated mess sometimes. You know what I mean? You can't. If you're having marital problems and you say, we're just going to put a Band-Aid on it, we'll deal with that later. That ain't how marriage works. You can't fix uh, wayward children on your own. You can't fix a job problem often on your own. You can't fix a financial situation. You know what? You need to, and certainly physical problems, I still believe in healing. But I believe it's the great physician. Uh, if, listen, if I had the power in my hand tonight to come up and heal you, I'd do it. I'd spend here, listen, you bring me lunch and supper and breakfast, I'd stay in here all day healing our church of their infirmities. I cannot do that. But I can pray for you. Amen. And I can pray to the one that can fix your problem. Amen. And intercede for you. Boy, I heard a song today, and if you get a chance to hear it, hopefully I'll give it to you at the end of the message. Um, uh, it'll come in my mind, the title of the song. But I... I believe that's where I left you off, where I about wrecked my truck listening to that song. Um, uh, let me give you the name of that song, because I'm telling you, if you about, I don't want nobody wrecking on the way home, so wait till you go to work tomorrow or something. But uh, I texted this song to some people today, because it just, when I heard it, and I just heard it uh, the first time, and uh, it's called, I Want You Beside Me. I Want You Beside Me. What a great song. And it talks about someone praying for their friend. And I thought, man, I hope somebody's praying for me. My goodness alive, by 11th hour. You'll love that song, I Want You Beside Me. Somebody needs to sing that in church soon, too, because that'd be a blessing. Amen? And it'd uh, be a blessing. So turn your Bible to uh, Galatians chapter number 5. And I want to give you a couple more things about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, that's where we left off two weeks ago, and I appreciate the, the fine men that have filled in and uh, in my absence I apologize both of them being back to back Wednesdays I typically don't do that occasionally be gone on a Wednesday but usually not back to back but uh, both of those were uh, times where I was preaching or in a conference there and so I, I hope you understand that in verse number 22 Galatians chapter 5 the Bible says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith then it goes on in verse 23 and says, Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be uh, desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have tonight, for these next few minutes, as we focus on the fruit of the Spirit. I pray, God, that you would help us, uh, Lord, in our studies tonight, that we grow in grace, and that we see that this fruit of the Spirit, Lord, if you don't have one, you don't have any. And, Lord, may we excel in this and try to be filled with the Spirit of God. I pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Randy, turn me back up just a little bit. I don't know what Angela does to our PA, but every time she gets up here, it starts ringing. And uh, I believe it's the devil that gets behind uh, behind something not wanting uh, us to hear the song she's about to sing but it starts ringing and of course it's this microphone so I'm using a different mic so you can turn me up just a tad bit and uh, but it's already been good to be in God's house isn't it I just I feel like preaching tonight a little bit and uh, kind of picking up where we left off Sunday and um, but I, I want you to notice go back to verse number 22 the Bible says but the fruit of the spirit is love we've covered love uh, a few weeks ago and joy uh, boy, do we ever need the joy of the Lord. Peace. Uh, we talked about that peace that passeth all understanding and long-suffering. And I think we, we of course, mentioned long-suffering and that it is uh, forbearance, patience, and endurance. And how long-suffering carries the idea of restraint and patience and how we should have that. Uh, endurance of mistreatment without anger. Uh, often people are going to mistreat you they're going to say things about you and it's a hard thing to accomplish in the flesh I, I got a phone call today from a preacher who um, uh, he was um, kind of upset and uh, some some another preacher that if I, I think if I called his name many of you at least have heard of him before but he was going around and saying hurtful things about me and this preacher just untrue things uh, and hurtful things and um, and it riled me up. And he called me and he said, Preacher, do you know this guy's doing this? Of course, we've had dealings with him a long time ago. And uh, nothing, you know, there's no bitterness, no anything like that. He just has no business 
saying those things because many of those things are not true. And, uh, you know, it hurts a little bit. I'll be honest, words hurt. Now, if he would have come to this, this church and, and hit me with a stick or, or, or beat me up, it wouldn't hurt any worse than him saying those hurtful things. And, and uh, it, it does hurt. But you know what? Often, and, and I've had to, you know, again, the Holy Spirit of God has convicted me about even saying things publicly about that man. Of course, I wouldn't say him and his name. But even reacting, I'm bad about reacting in a way and, and uh, struggling in that area and I confess that I'm convicted by that and uh, first thing we want to do is go to social media and post things and so I, I, I had to delete some things that I said today uh, not to him publicly but just as some things that was on my thought and of course Rebecca gives me those evil eyes when um, I do those things and um, try to control that and it's something that listen it's something that is real it's something that I struggle with my spirit my spirit gets uh, affected by others now church members is one thing when someone reacts in a way and of course they're, they're the sheep I'm the shepherd so to speak the under shepherd so I have to be that way with another preacher another shepherd attacks uh, that's a little different you know and it, I, I kind of look at it differently you know if you're one of your church members uh, says something or does something and you it kind of you know it, it may hurt you but it's in a different kind of hurt you really truly love them and uh, it's a different kind of hurt. I can't explain it to you, uh, but when another shepherd says something and it's hurtful, you almost feel like you want to take that staff and go weld them over the head with it and say, I'll show you And uh, because, hey, you ought to know how it feels, and uh, this guy, you know, he should know better, and I should know better, and so uh, it's all good. But long-suffering was needed to be exercised right now because we can apply that even in our... We can apply that even in our... In, some of you is like, you mean preachers do it? Preachers do it all the time and uh, all the time. And uh, it, it struggles. It always has been. And if you only knew uh, some of the things that's done and uh, in, in, in politics of preaching, it can be a very bad thing. And so long-suffering, though, is a spirit-produced virtue that enables us to put up with people who try our patience. That's exactly what happens. Uh, it could be the preacher across town. Now, fortunate for me... Um, I don't know anybody in this area hardly. And so I don't have a man across town, so to speak. But the longer I'm here, sometimes it does establish a guy across town that may say some hurtful things about our church. You know what we should do? We should just let them say it instead of retaliating and going after someone. Hey, they live in our town. Now, there's, I'm sure there's people that don't like the church. You, not everybody's going to like your church. There's going to be some people that try to sow discord in the church. You know what we ought to do? We ought to just love those people. And I'm not talking about our inner family. I'm talking about folks on the outside that say saying hurtful things. I know they do. But you know what we ought to do? We ought to not retaliate. We ought to exercise long-suffering. And that goes, listen, between you husbands and wives. Uh, we ought to have long-suffering toward each other. And uh, you, you ain't always going to get along. It's, it, you're going you're gonna to have problems. So when the flesh says retaliate, long-suffering says love them. Long-suffering is one of God's attributes. Psalms 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and in truth. So if we live in the Spirit and we're filled with the Spirit, we will be long-suffering even under mistreatment. God knew that I would need this today, even in my own personal life. God knew that we would need that. Isn't it wonderful that the Bible applies to today, what we need? You need it, and some people's like, well, the preacher may not need it. I need it just as much as you need it, sometimes more, because you're not only carrying the load of the church, you're carrying the load of your family, and then when you start traveling and preaching for other guys and preaching across, you run into people that just don't always line up the way you do, and it's just going to be that way. You've got to exercise long-suffering. And this is the greatest example. Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they departed his raiment. They parted his raiment and cast lots. What the, that's the greatest example of long-suffering. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Then the fruit of gentleness. We talked about this. Gentleness is the Greek. It's krestosos, which means Useful, profitable, gracious, kind, and, uh, and profitable. It is, Noel Webster said, it is gentle behavior, softness of manners, mildness of temper, sweetness of disposition, meekness. 
Gentleness is best defined as grace in action. Isn't that good? Grace in action. It speaks of genuine, tender concern for others. And so can I ask you a question tonight before we move on to the new fruit of the Spirit that we're going to talk about tonight for just about 15 minutes. Uh, are you gentle with people? Are you a gentle person? Uh, the Bible says that uh, 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive. Now that's talking about a pastor. Uh, that's talking about one that's in leadership. A servant of the Lord should not strive. We should not have strife. I think it's in Timothy 2 where it says that, that the office of a bishop, it describes a bishop, but it also describes a man that should not be a striker. You know what? Um, I, I was in a, There was a church not too long uh, ago from where I was raised, probably 25 miles from the church that I was raised at. Literally, that man, that pastor uh, and some deacons got into it. Uh, and I mean, they were having some issues um, the, some, the church was having major, major problems. I mean, major problems. The deacons, uh, one man in particular, uh, got mad at the pastor. The pastor was about my age. The deacon was like 65. And the deacon drives to that pastor's house one night, mad as a hornet, and has two other men with him. And it was over something in the church, and, and tempers had gotten raised pretty high and that deacon went there and knocked on that preacher's door and the preacher said sir uh, you're going to have to get off my you know get off my porch and uh, you're not welcome here and, and all that well, anyway so the man kept making threats the older older deacon and so that young preacher came out on the porch and said I've warned you not and he beat the fire out of that deacon put him in the hospital it made the news listen that deacon beat I'm talking about uh, the, the older gentleman, I mean, that young man just came out there and the, the pastor of the church and beat the fire out of the deacon. Right there, I'm talking about 20 miles from our church and, and, and heard about it. It made the... What a horrible testimony for an independent Baptist church. By the way, still going at it today and probably still beating each other up. How would you like for that Sunday morning knowing that your pastor beat the deacon up and he's in the hospital and he gets up and tries to preach on the love of God in the service that morning and you're thinking man and uh, and folks I am not lying I'm telling you the truth it happened there and, and not, not far from our hometown and I know it to be a fact uh, very much so and so uh, that is not listen not, not that we should be a pushover but we sure we certainly shouldn't be a striker not that way protecting our family yes doing all those things yes defending our freedom yes but not because a guy come on your porch and he was saying some things and you come out there and you literally take your hands and you beat a man that's the craziest stuff i've ever heard in my life especially a man in your church a deacon a man older than you are man listen it shouldn't have happened it was awful and uh, that man needed to understand that the fruit of the Spirit, nowhere do I see in this fruit of the Spirit a man is supposed to be attacking another man like that. And remember, remember, gentleness is grace in action. So the next fruit that we're going to look at tonight is the fruit of goodness. The fruit of goodness, it comes from a word, uh, a Greek word, agathosis, and it speaks of honesty, integrity of heart, that not only despises evil, but refrains from doing it. So goodness, it is a heart condition that produces a good lifestyle. Goodness. You say, well, preacher, that's pretty simple. We know that we're supposed to do good, but this, this even goes a little bit further than that. It speaks of literally the integrity of the heart. It talks about what your heart is. And it is a conviction with action. This goodness is a characteristic of God. David said this, and I love this verse in Psalms 27, 13. David said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What a great verse. The goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is the same goodness that is reproduced in the Christian's life as he yields to the Spirit of God. That's why it's important for us to be filled with the Spirit. It's important for us to be yielded to the Spirit of God. It is a quality that we need in dealing with others. Goodness. Hey, how honest are you with people? 
How honest? Do you find yourself beating people out of money? Do you find yourself out of, uh, well, I'll let that go to collections and then I'll pay the very bottom I possibly can pay? That's not an honest Christian. Amen. It's very quiet. I know it will be. Because then we're starting to deal with honesty. Well, how can, I get, how can I get the upper hand in this deal? How can I beat them out of some money? How can I be shady in this deal? I don't see Christ doing that. It's not, not, we shouldn't be known as shady characters. We shouldn't be known as how can I cover this up and how can I get away with this and how can I be, uh, how can I be, listen, I know that things and circumstances happen that's out of your control. I'm not saying that if you've ever had a bad dealing on your credit that something, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we ought to try our best to do our best to keep our testimony uh, with God and with man clean and clear. Where Back years ago, my father, my, my, my dad's dad, my grandfather, who's 89 years old today, Ray Cox, not today, but he's 89 years old uh, this year, um, in June, I believe, he uh, bought the farm, the Cox family farm in West Virginia that's still there, the homestead there, uh, my, where the literally the little house where my dad was born, still on that little piece of land there. And you know how he bought that, bought that land? He shook a man's hand. He said, I'll make payments to Mark Comer. Uh, he tells a story because Mark Comer's son, uh, who now is Ronnie Comer, uh, who pastors the Grapevine Baptist Church, little we know that all that handshake would produce preachers. Amen. And uh, Ronnie Comer's, uh, Mark Comer's son, uh, and uh, then Ma Ronnie Comer had a son who's the youth pastor. His name's Matt Comer. Matt's a dear friend of mine. And uh, that handshake there, my grandpa bought a plot of land uh, about 30 or 40 acres from Mark Homer and he did not sign on the dotted line he did not do anything he just shook a man's hand and by the way my grandpa was a drunk wasn't a Christian so let me ask you a question does a drunk have more character than a Christian I mean do we when we say we're going to pay somebody and we're, we're going to do this we're going to pay you now and we're going to do it by then are you trying your best to do it by that date? Are you really meaning that you're going to, well, I, I, I'll pay him, but I'll get to it whenever I get the money. No, unless that was in the understanding, you need to do the best you can and be honest. Be honest. Repay your debts. Goodness. Goodness. Uh, the Bible says in Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. That means that you and I should be doing good to each other, especially those that are in the same church, the same faith. That means that you should not be sitting over here on Sunday at odds with your brother over here over a dispute of dishonesty and uh, integrity and all those things. Friend, uh, this ought to be the cleanest church in town. And I'm not just talking about physically, I'm talking about spiritually. Your dealings in the community. When these people come out here to work on our, uh, on our uh, property and they do all this and they give us the invoice, this church is going to pay you. We're going to pay you. We're not going to sit here and get a bad testimony and say, well, we're not, we'll pay you when we get to it. No, we're going to write you the check then. If we don't have the money, we're not doing it. Amen. My dad moved to Moxville years ago in uh, 1984. 1984, he became pastor of the Trinity Baptist Church. He's still there 34 years later. He said when he got to town, church had about 80 people. They were about $400,000 in debt. Back in 84, that was a lot of money. Still a lot of money today, but it certainly is a lot of money in 1984. And uh, couldn't barely make their payments. Matter of fact, they owed everybody in town. And my dad walked in the parts store there, the only parts store in town, and there was a sign behind the counter that says, Do not lend any parts to Trinity Baptist Church. They could not even get parts to fix their buses because they were so indebted to that parts store. A church. 
that had a bad testimony in town of not paying people. And you know what he did? He said, the first thing I started doing was making sure that when we, we, we started sending money to these places that we owe, we'd call every place that we owed money and said, where are we standing with you? And we're going, how much do we owe you? Can we start? And they started knocking them down. He said, it took a little while, but we paid all of our debts off all these places and he said 34 years later I could walk in any business today and borrow whatever I want to borrow because we have good standing would to God our Christians have the same thing goodness goodness that's the fruit of the spirit it is a quality that we need in dealing with others hey how in the world are we going to witness to our neighbor our friend our co-worker when we've beat them out of money Oh, well, well, what about that $100 you said you're going to loan me? And here you are talking to them about the Lord? Uh-uh. How about pay them the $100, then you talk to them about the Lord? Amen. Y'all wish I was out on a trip again. I know you did. Look at this. The next, the fruit of the goodness. The fruit of faith. How about this? Look at faith. Notice it says in verse 22... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith is the virtue that takes God at His word. Takes God at His word. It is God said it, and that settles it. You ever seen the slogan, God said it, I believe it, that settles it? You, know, you might as well take I believe it out. God said it, and that settles it. Whether you believe it or not. Amen. Boy, that's good right there. We ought to just bow in prayer. It is God that said it, and that settles it. That's faith. Faith does not question God. There is no other grounds upon which we approach God. There is no other avenue by which we live the Christian life. It is all faith and nothing else. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So God never requires that we understand His plan. God does not require that we understand His purpose, just that we obey Him. God, listen, God blesses those that obey Him. You don't always understand it. You don't always see it clear. And God does not require you to see it. Thank God. But He does require us to follow through by faith and obey His will. And God will bless you through it. And bless you by it. We need no explanations. God's not going to give us an explanation of what He's doing. He does it. And by the way, what God does is always right. No, we don't require. I don't say, God, now you need to explain what you're doing to me. I don't understand this. Hold on. No, God ain't going to do that to you. He just wants us to step out on faith. Faith. For we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The Bible declares that the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3, 11. This is another word that requires action. It is faith that produces Faithfulness. Let's say that together. One, two, three. Faithfulness. Say it one more time. I hope it gets in you. Faithfulness. That's when we say, hey, are you faithful? Are you faithful to church? Are, faith is in that word. It requires faithfulness. I would rather have faithfulness than talent. I would rather have faithfulness than charisma. I would rather have someone faithful that can, that can play the piano, but it's maybe not the best you've ever heard, but they're there every time the doors are open. I'd rather have someone that can sing a special, and it may be not the best you've ever heard, but their buddy, every time they're scheduled, they sing. I'd rather have someone that was kind of a mediocre nursery worker, but every time they're on the schedule, they're there. You say, why? Because of faithfulness. Faithfulness trumps talent. Trumps talent. Don't give me the guy that comes in and he acts like I'm the best worker that God's ever produced. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in someone who just comes in and says, Preacher, where do you want me? I'll be there. Isn't that faithfulness? Faithfulness. God never requires that we understand it, but He just wants us to obey it. And faith is often tried, but true faith endures regardless of the circumstances. Hey, isn't that what I said before we started the message tonight? That 
faithfulness it, it even listen it's often tested it's often uh you say well preacher i'm just going through a hard time right now so we're just going to take a break from church no that's not faithfulness won't you just show god and show the devil and show everybody else that you really mean business when you show up and everything else is falling apart that's faithfulness if i preached every time i felt like it you'd be looking for another preacher I mean, you, you, I always feel like preaching. There's days where I feel like preaching. There's days where I don't. But we preach anyhow because we want to be faithful. Faithful to the calling. Faith. Well, I just don't feel like coming to church today. Man, what if we all had that option? I just don't feel like doing this. I don't feel... Hey, you know, whether you feel it or not, let's just try faith it. Just show up. Be there. I don't feel like singing the choir today. Sing anyhow. Maybe in the middle of the song, you'll start feeling like it. Amen. There's been times where I've not felt like doing what I'm doing, but I thank God that I did. Boy, I do feel like preaching tonight. I do. I'm telling you, this will preach. James 1, 3, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So the trials and tribulations of this world do not stop the faithful. It doesn't... Hey, thank God that there is a remnant, a faithful remnant. And there always has been and there always will be. There's a faithful remnant at this church that I can count on. Them people are going to be there no matter if it's raining as hard as you can... I mean, if we're canoeing in here... There's going to be that faithful remnant there. There's always been a remnant. And you know, what we pray for as pastors is, God, will you increase that remnant? And then, you know, you're going to have those that are just always on the edge, always standing on the outside looking. You'll have those come in. We love them too. But God, increase our remnant. Our core. We call them the core crowd. The core people. Buddy, they're there. Hey, rain or shine, they're there. They're faithful through tribulations. Hey, my dad, we had a friend uh, this past week, uh, a lady um, that uh, I've known my whole life. She just suddenly passed away at, uh, at uh, let's see, she was 54 years old. Dad called me and said um, she went in and had some, she had a bleeding ulcer in her stomach or something and I don't know if what happened, but anyway, she died there in the hospital this week. It was this past, it was this past Thursday, and uh, he called me. He said, "Can you believe this lady in the church passed away?" And I said, uh, "Man, I can't believe that, Dad. I, I know their family and know her husband." And so he preached the funeral. I think she died on Wednesday, and they had the funeral on Saturday. And uh, she was a saved woman, and and uh, the husband is very active in the church there. Sunday morning, my dad's bus route rolls up, and this man for years has been taking the count at the church he, he's there with a the clipboard and every time the bus rolls up we got 15 16 bus routes and uh the buses would just come in he said okay the door would open how many did you have today and he writes it down on the clipboard and he takes the roll that way when the buses come in and that man's husband or that rather that man's wife was just buried saturday and he's out there sunday morning taking roll my dad said man he opened the door and he said what are you doing out here today he said preacher i read my bible this morning god ain't changed heaven ain't changed my salvation is sealed and settled my wife's in heaven why would i lay at home today he said preacher i want to be in church i want to be doing what i'm doing you know what he was saying preacher i'm faithful i'm faithful man that charged my batteries when he said that Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Revelation 2.10 Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Faith asks no questions. It requires no explanations and fears no consequences. It simply believes and obeys. And faith is not only believing regardless of evidence, it is obeying regardless of consequences. Regardless of your outcomes. Brother Roy, I cannot promise you up here that things is going to get, uh, is always going to be good and get better. I can't promise you that. But I can promise you this, that if you're faithful, one day you'll get that well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you won't get that well done, thou good and faithful servant, unless you've done well. 
consequences. I cannot, I cannot promise you they're always going to be the outcome that you pray for. Can I just ask you real quick before we close tonight, how many of you, before you got married and, and maybe right before you graduated high school, you had this in your mind, what life is going to be, and it worked exactly the way that you dreamed. How many of you that actually happened? Tony Gilliam, did that really? I'm sure. <laughs> Anybody that just everything's worked the way that, buddy, you dreamed it and everything's just all fell to pieces, please be honest. I'd love to hear your testimony tonight. You know what? None of us have. None of us. You might have married your high school sweetheart, but you still have had disappointments. Oh, yes. Oh, isn't it sound great? Oh, I, I've loved him since K-4. It does. Oh, it's wonderful. Listen, it's wonderful. I love it when I hear that sweethearts met in high school and, and this is the only people we've ever known. And all. But I don't even care if you met in kindergarten. Everything has not met your expectations and your dreams. Consequences out of your control, trials, tribulations. You found out the good, the bad, the ugly about them that you did not know in K-4. You probably wouldn't have married them. You found out what you did like and what you really strongly dislike. You found out all those things and it ain't exact. Oh, preacher, if I would have known all those things, I probably would have stayed away from them. Hey, you know what, though? The thing is, is you, met, you said those wedding vows down here, did they mean anything? How about that part where it says for better, for worse? Because there's going to be a lot of worse. There's going to be some really good days, but there's going to be some bad days. Every time a bad day happens, you just bail out. You just get mad. I'm done. I'm done. Really? Do you do that to God? I'm glad He didn't do that to us. Amen. Faithful. Faithful. We see that faith is not only believing regardless of evidence, it is obeying regardless of consequences. And the last is fruit of meekness. Look at that next word, meekness. Brother Jacob, you can come to the piano. Meekness is a word that basically means mild, gentle, soft-tempered. Soft-tempered. Meekness is not weakness or lack of power. Rather, it is power under control. So, tonight, as we prepare to give a little invitation, even on Wednesday nights, think about these through the Spirit. We often think that someone that is meek is just a weak person. We can walk all over them. That's not true. We often think that someone that has a hot temper and is angry at the world when he flies off the, 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 the just flies off at everybody. Oh, that's a, that's that guy right there. He's no, he's not in control. He's out of control. You know, it's kind of like that yoke that's under the that that ox, that big stout ox. He is a tremendous power. I mean, an ox can take care of a lot of things on a farm. But that little yoke that he's under and able to be turned in any direction by the will of his master, that one little yoke is actually what controls that ox. A big thing that's controlled by a little thing. I often think that that's kind of like meekness. Jesus is the perfect example of meekness. The Bible says in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Meekness is also a requirement for reaching people. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 25, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. So it is a requirement for restoring the fallen. Galatians chapter 6, we're actually going to get to this next week on restoration. The Bible says, though, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such, on one, uh, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So what fruit does God use to restore a believer back into the family of God? He uses the fruit of joy. No. He uses the fruit of love. No, he doesn't use the fruit of love. He does not even use the fruit of long suffering and peace. He uses the fruit of meekness. Wow. 
Meekness results in the character to control and discipline ourselves. Do you have self-control tonight? Self-discipline? Uh, discipline where someone that does not have discipline in their life is really a, it's like a train wreck. Train out of control. Thousands upon thousands of pounds going down the track nowhere to go and you know the end result is going to be a disaster I pray that our church would have some type of discipline some meekness some, some um, where you're under control and you you, you, you you know our church is known for that our church well, those are some meek and mild people they love the Lord they, there's a meekness about them they're not weak they stand strong on the word of God they stand strong for the Savior but they're not mad about it amen I'm not mad about anything you ever heard a preacher preach before and it sounds like he's mad at everybody gets up and says I'm King James Bible only and everybody's like man what are you angry about why do you got to be that way? Why can't you say, I stand upon the Word of God and I'm not changing? I believe it. And buddy, they'll just and bless God for all of you. You can hit the door. Really? Because that's exactly what they'll do. Or how about exercising meekness and saying, you know what, you may not believe that way, but I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit of God convicts you about that and that you get right about it. You may not be up to the standard but how about we exercise meekness instead of killing everybody and having me, myself, and I sit here and say, man, I'll tell you one thing, that guy down there, boy, he, whew, if you don't live up to that what he thinks, you're going to get killed in church. There's enough of that. How about we just preach the Word where the Bible says be loud, let's be loud, and where the Bible is quiet, let's just be quiet about it. Amen. The Bible's awful loud about some things that we need to be loud about. I'm telling you, the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, the bodily resurrection. Hey, we know those things. The, 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 the uh, inspiration of the Scriptures and the preservation of the Scriptures and the eternal security of the believer. Those things we ought to be loud about. But the things that the Bible has remained quiet about, why do we have to trump those things up? Let's have some meekness. Let's, let's, let's not be weak in some areas, but let's also be meek, under control. There's a difference. Not weak, but meek. Amen? And let's be honest. Let's be good. If you owe people money, try your best to pay them. Let's be good to those that are in the household of faith. Let's exercise the fruit of the Spirit. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads tonight. Ask the Lord to help you. I believe everybody here tonight that um, I don't see too many first-time visitors or anybody here that would be a first-time visitor tonight, but I do see that mostly our people are here tonight. So let me ask you this question tonight here on a Wednesday night Bible study. How many would say, Preacher, out of the fruit of the Spirit that we covered tonight, the Lord spoke to my heart about a certain matter. Not saying that you're beating people out of money if you raise your hand. Not saying that you're not good, not saying that you're not trying. The Bible says there's none that doeth good. So if you're trying to do good, that we, we really can't. But we can possess the fruit of the Spirit, which is goodness, and try to be good to our neighbor. Meekness. Hey, are you flying off the handle and screaming at everybody and upset and losing your cool? And Or are you controlling yourself? Temperance. We need, we need to ask the Lord to help.